Welcome back, everyone, to the Equal Academy e-learning platform today. My name is AJ Raj, back with another geometry video for you all today. And today's lesson topic is all about coordinate applications of figures. Now, before we jump into today's topic, please make sure to smash that subscribe button down below, hit that like button on this video, as well as turning on post notifications to get notified on any of our latest posts. That's a little bell down below the subscribe button. Uh, all of those things are very greatly appreciated. So coordinate applications of figures is a very important topic in all of geometry. I'm just going to be highlighting the majority of you know basic topics, uh, basic figures that we're going to be coming across in geometry. But the coordinate plane does tie into geometry um, very well and very specifically because polygons in general, which are shapes that are contain any of your shapes that are um, closed figures that contain any straight sides. Um, they're all they're going to be consistent all throughout geometry, and a lot of the time we're going to be seeing them on um, blank planes or coordinate planes. And coordinate planes are actually much more easier to use because they um, involve numeric values and numeric calculations and different relations amongst points in a plane. So coordinate uh, applications of figures is um, just as important as you know describing different formulas of figures because it's a much easier way of understanding this through numeric value, which is much more accurate. So we're going to discover today what are some properties of quadrilaterals and triangles and how can they be represented on the coordinate plane. So we're just going to be focusing on our basic quadrilaterals. Um, like I showed you in a previous video, I talked about the classes of quadrilaterals and then we're also going to be going over triangles and how exactly they can be represented on the coordinate plane. And we're going to look at um, these different rules, uh, a new formula that I'm going to introduce to show you how exactly we can calculate uh, certain problems. And then, of course, I'm going to show you some problems in which you actually execute this formula. So let's jump right into it. So let's first start off by identifying some basic quadrilaterals that we haven't yet come across. And we're going to basically close out that chapter in all of our quadrilaterals. I'm going to be showing all the properties, the basic properties of all of our quadrilaterals, um, such as their area and perimeter formula and some of their properties that they consist of and how they're actually classified. So I'm gonna go over those quadrilaterals and triangles. I'm gonna also go over, um, try and give you a bit of a recap on exactly what their perimeter and area formulas are and some basic properties that they have in classification. And finally, we're gonna go and apply them in basically what our purpose is for today, coordinate applications. So we're gonna give them coordinate applications and then we're gonna actually do, um, do some uh, practice problems with the formula that I'm going to give you. So let's start off with parallelograms. Parallelograms, um, very important quadrilateral, very important figure throughout all of geometry. So let's start off with parallelograms. So properties of parallelograms. And the way that I'm organizing this is we're going to start um, by looking at quadrilaterals. Quadrilaterals are any shapes that have four sides, and I have already clarified that in previous videos. Quadrilaterals are any figures that have four sides and are, you know, are a type of polygon. And there are two subsets of quadrilaterals, and that is parallelograms and trapezoids. And underneath parallelograms, you have all these different types of figures that you are, are supposed to be familiar with already, which are like rhombuses, tri um, sorry, not triangles, rhombuses, square, um, and rectangles. Those are three figures under parallelograms. So we're going to start with parallelograms and trapezoids, and then we're going to go uh, much more specific until we get to triangles. And then we're going to look at our problems and our distance, and our distance formula. So let's look at the properties of parallelograms. So a parallelogram, uh, its geometric definition is a quadrilateral, which is a figure with four sides that has two pairs of parallel sides. Um, and on a parallelogram, arrowheads show the congruence of two parallel sides, meaning that the two pairs of parallel sides on a, on a parallelogram, they're always going to be congruent. So you're going to have two sets of equivalent sides, and those are the sides that are opposite from each other and that are parallel from parallel to each other, meaning they have the same exact slope. And so you're going to have two pair, uh, one pair that has um, singular marks, uh, which are indicated by arrowheads right here. So arrowheads show the congruence of two parallel sides. So singular marks are going to be for one pair and double marks are going to be for the second pair. And that's merely just to dis distinguish um, between the um, congruence of two sets of parallel sides on a parallelogram. So as you can see here, we have two arrowheads here. So um, you could also draw tick marks. So this side would be a congruent to this side and also parallel. So the congruent sides, um, the sides that are congruent to each other are always going to be parallel to each other. So as you can see, the singular tick marks are the singular arrowheads. Uh, these two sides, AB and DC, are both going to be congruent and parallel as AD and BC are also going to be congruent as well as parallel. 
And there are many, many relationships with parallelograms. As you can see here, you can see these diagonals with these tick marks showing um, that the diagonals are going to be congruent and it, uh, each diagonal bisects each other. But I'm going to be doing full lessons on parallelograms. Parallelograms, there's a lot, of, a lot to exploit off of them. So we're going to do an entire um, sequence of lessons later on. They're much more complex co um, concepts. So we're going to be building up to, towards parallelograms and towards these higher complex relationships, such as diagonals of figures. So that's parallelograms part one. We're now we're moving on to parallelograms part two. And we're gonna focus on the area formula for parallelograms. Um, so for any figure, you know, perimeter is very basic. You don't necessarily need a formula uh, for parallelograms. That's just a sum of all sides. So you can do, you know, two times the two, you can multiply it by um, double, each set of parallel sides and there are shortcuts just as a rectangle but it's merely just the sum of all sides but for area it's a bit more complex so i'm going to be showing you how we're going to get our formula here what the formula is and how exactly we derive the formula so uh the formula for a parallelogram is area equals base times height so i can write this out here outside of keyboard context so that's area equals base times the height. And that's basically um, the same formula as a rectangle. Because remember how I said in previous videos, um, and if you don't already know, the rectangle um, has a length and a width defining its dimensions for area specifically. But the length and the width are both equivalent as it's the same thing as saying your base and your height. So the length and the width is just the same thing as saying your base and your height. So it's basically in turn the same exact um, area formula for a rectangle as it is for a parallelogram. And that's because a rectangle is a type of parallelogram. And the base of a parallelogram is any side of a parallelogram. You can choose any side that you'd like, but you just have to um, clarify which one is which. And then the altitude rises perpendicular to the base. So it's an, an altitude will, ri uh, will rise perpendicular to any base that you choose any side of the parallelogram. And what it does is it rises perpendicular, meaning it forms a 90 degree angle when it intersects um, one of those bases. And then it goes to the opposite side, meaning a vertex at that point or its extensions, meaning um, it might not necessarily be on the inside of the parallelogram. It might have to be extended outwards by a dashed line. So this is an example of a height. So this is one of the heights. You would choose uh, one of the side lengths here. And B, obviously, here represents the side length because it's inter intersected by the altitude at a 90 degree angle here. So it's perpendicular. And as you can see, this altitude will come and intersect the opposite vertex here. But you can also. Um, you can also keep this on the exterior of the parallelogram if you wanted to use this side here as the base right here. Um, if you wanted to use B as the base here, you could also extend this side here, base B. You could extend this side outwards like this, and you can connect this altitude over here downwards to base B, and that would form a 90 degree angle as well. So you can make an extension of it, but it's most popular to keep it on the inside of the interior of the parallelogram. Everything's much easier to calculate. Let's move on to parallelograms part three, and let's actually look at how we derive the equation. So now we've defined parallelograms, their basic general properties and principles that they follow, the area formula, and now we're just going to be deriving that equation. So the equation for the area of a parallelogram is the same as the equation for rectangles, rhombuses, and squares, because they're all specific special types of parallelograms. In turn, they're going to have the same exact uh, type of formula, just different terminologies. Like aside from length and width, you can have base and height. And rhombuses, uh, since rectangles and squares are both, since a square is a type of rectangle, it's going to have the same area formula. And since a rectangle is a type of parallelogram, it's also going to have the same type of area formula. Same thing, a rhombus is a specific type of parallelogram. And a rhombus it is basically a special, it's a specific um, type of parallelogram because it looks most like a parallelogram. It has the same exact defining features. It's just a parallelogram with four equivalent sides. That's all it is. So it's still going to be your base times height with those same terminologies. So how are we actually going to derive the equation? If you look at the 90 degree triangle created by the altitude um, in a parallelogram, when you're trying to show the altitude on the inside of a parallelogram, uh, you can see how the parallelogram has the same area as a rectangle. So if you take this triangle here, um, after you create the altitude with a side AD as your base, you can see that a right triangle is created right here. So that's right triangle right here. So you can see this right triangle. And once you've created that right triangle here, you have a trapezoid at this end here. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take this right triangle and all you're gonna do is you're gonna flip it so that it fits perfectly in this area here. So once it fits perfectly here, 
you're trying to fit it perfectly right here. So this will this will cross out and this triangle will be reverted to here. And what happens is you're actually just gonna form a rectangle, a rectangle with the same exact dimension, the same height and the same length as well. So that's why it's going to be equivalent to the area of a rectangle because a parallelogram basically can be reverted to a, a rectangle in that same aspect with relative dimension. So that's a little um, cool um, derive, a uh, cool um, way of actually deriving the equation from a rectangle, something that we're all basically familiar with. Now let's look at trapezoid. So this is the second type of quadrilateral. This is the second type of classification. We've already went into specifics about rectangles, squ squares, and I've just recapped on rhombuses as well as parallelograms. So now all that we have left is trapezoid, which is our second uh, class of quadrilaterals, which is basically its own little section. It's it's a very unique figure, uh, very displaced figure from the rest of our quadrilaterals given. So um, trapezoids, uh, let's look at properties of trapezoids. So trapezoids, quadrilateral, which is four sides. Um, so it's a class of quadrilateral with exactly one pair of parallel sides. So as you can see, it's much more different from parallelograms and all the different types of parallelograms. It only has one pair of parallel sides and only one pair of, pair, of, pair of parallel sides. So in an upright trapezoid, meaning a trapezoid that's standing upright, not being rotated around, the long sides connecting the top and bottom are congruent, uh, are the congruent parallel sides. So what that's saying is um, in an upright, uh, basically an upright trapezoid, you're gonna, you can see here that obviously DC, side DC, Length, uh, side DC is obviously going to be congruent to side AB. So it's what can it's what um, it's the long sides that basically connect these slanting sides here, and that's in an upright uh, trapezoid. So some different types of trapezoids include the right trapezoid, which is your proper trapezoid, and that will actually have that, that is possible to have three congruent sides, but not all parallel sides. So as you can see here, DA is not parallel to CV by any means, making this a trapezoid. So let's look at the area formula for trapezoids. Um, the non-parallel sides, let's give a bit of a backstory to this formula. So the non-parallel sides of the trapezoids are the bases, meaning the, um, you can consider them the bases, the um, the slanting sides, but I'd, I'd consider them the leg because you can always choose um, uh, in between. So the legs are the parallel sides of the trapezoid. Um, the non-parallel sides are, of the trapezoid are the bases, but you can always revert them, meaning I like to revert these around. Um, this is how I was taught this before, but I would actually revert this. So I would consider the sides that are actually parallel, the bases, because it's much easier to work within the equation. And you can also use the legs um, as the parallel sides of the trapezoid. So the area, the reason that I'm saying that is because the area formula that I'm going to show you is the easiest to be used. There's a different form of this um, trapezoid formula, uh, um, but however, it goes much easier and smoothly with equations. And we're just going to re-identify that. So we're actually going to switch this and I'm going to cross this out here and I'm going to put um, legs and here I'm gonna put bases so that it's much easier to identify with this equation. So the area, oh, sorry about that. So I'll write this out here, bases. So the area of a trapezoid equation in this format with the non-parallel sides being the legs and the parallel sides being the bases, it's going to be one half base one plus base two times height. So I'll write that out here um, like this. So. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you this parallel, uh, this trapezoid here. So I'll write this out right here. So it's one half times base one. Base one can be put down as a, um, as like a base, um, uh, base, base yield exponent and then a base two here. That's how we classify it in geometry. And then you're gonna multiply it by the height of the trapezoid. So what this is basically doing here is you're taking, um, the first base, meaning it can be the bottom base or the top base. So let's say that this is base one here. All right, this down here, base one, and we can make this base two up here. So that's that's side A and side H. So this is base one, and this is base two right here. And all we're doing here is in this area here, we're adding them together and then we're dividing them by two. So all we're doing is we're calculating the averages between the bases. And then once we've done that, we're just gonna multiply by the height indi indicated by H. It's the altitude, a perpendicular to one of the bases. That's all you need. It's, and the altitude is always going to be um, relative and equivalent uh, no matter which base it's, it's emerging from and intersecting. So that's the area formula for a trapezoid. 
And let's look at some unique relationships with the trapezoid. Let's look at one very specific one. And that is basically a scenario in which you're going to use a rigid motion. So when a trapezoid is rotated 180 degrees, um, well, one trapezoid rotated 180 degrees that is connected with another congruent trapezoid will form a parallelogram with twice their area. So what that'll look like is, so I'm going to draw a trapezoid right here. And what we're going to do is um, we're going to put another trapezoid. So we'll, we'll keep this trapezoid here and we're gonna put another trapezoid right here. So let's keep this trapezoid right down here. And let's just say that these two trapezoids that I'm drawing out here are going to be congruent, meaning they have the same exact shape and size. So same exact area, um, size, and um, not necessarily position, as you can see, um, they're um, in different positions and locations. So let's assume that these two trapezoids are um, congruent. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna take this trapezoid and we're gonna connect one of its edges um, in, in like a puzzle piece to the other side. And that's basically a 180 degree rotation. And when we do that, we're gonna eliminate this trapezoid here, just trying to show you that we're gonna move it. We're gonna move it out here to this trapezoid here. So we're gonna connect that here. And once we connect it, you can see, we've basically just connected two trapezoids by flipping one over and connecting it like a puzzle piece to the original one. Um, and since they're both congruent, they will form a parallelogram. So it'll form one giant parallelogram that'll have twice their area. And that's where the one half comes into play if you're looking at it in terms of a parallelogram. So that's a little neat relationship between parallelograms and trapezoids. Now let's just give a little, I'll give you guys a little recap on triangles and quadrilaterals, some that we've already come across, just giving you their basic formulas before we actually jump into some examples with our new formula that we're gonna come across and coordinate application problems. So let's look at area and perimeter of basic figures that we already know. So perimeter for any figure is the sum of all sides. So you don't need a specific uh, equation for that for any polygon. Um, but now let's look at basic figures that we've already come across. So we have rectangles and squares, which their area is basically length times the width, the length of a figure times the width of the figure. That's because the reason that they have the same exact format of uh, Area is because square is a specific type of rectangle, and the area formula for a rectangle is length times width. And then for a triangle, any triangle, it's going to be your base times your height, or your altitude times your height, divided by two, because in technicality, all triangles are going to be equivalent to one half of a rectangle with the same exact given dimensions. And finally, you have a rhombus, which is a specific type of uh, parallelogram with all equivalent sides. And that's just going to be base times height, same equation as a parallelogram. And then your parallelogram is gonna be base times height. And then your trapezoid is gonna be the average of your bases divided by, it's gonna be the average of your bases, which is base one plus base two divided by two, multiplied by your height to get your area. So these are some examples of your rectangles. Um, your triangles and your rhombuses. And um, yeah, so those are your basic figures. And now let's look to um, the, basically the overall theme and purpose, the new lesson that we're gonna come across today. Uh, it's gonna be coordinate application. So let's get right into it. Let's look at the formula before we actually look at the problem. So well, let's look at the distance formula. I'm sure many of you have already heard of this. It's a very, it, it may, might seem like a very long formula and something that's very strenuous, but it's actually very important you're going to be using this all throughout geometry and many other heightened concepts. It's heavily, it's only revolved around the coordinate plane, and it's very important to know when identifying figures on the coordinate plane. So uh, we're going to represent figures on a coordinate plane. In order to represent, like, coordinate application is basically how you represent a figure on a coordinate plane. The only way to do that is if you use a distance formula or if you're given um, vertical or, or um, horizontal lines, and I'll get into that. So this is what the distance formula is. It's basically when you take two coordinates in the form of x, y. So x, y, and x, y. And you're taking uh, the coordinate a pair from each equation. So let's say that this is equation one. I'm sorry, this is coordinate one and coordinate two on the coordinate plane. And all you're doing is you're taking x2. x2 would be the x coordinate from the second coordinate pair. And you don't necessarily need to um, you know, keep it consistent. Like the first one that you see has to be the x1. First one has to be the x2. All that has to be the same is that the um, 
same value from the same coordinate from each uh, coordinate pair has to be consistent, meaning x2 has to be the same as y2, meaning that this x has to be in the same position as this x, as this x has to be in the same position as this y. Sorry, this x has to be in the same position as this y. So that's how it, uh, this distance formula actually works. And all you're going to do is you're going to plug this in. And what this does is you're basically calculating the distance between two points. On a coordinate plane, on a coordinate grid, um, the only way that you can calculate points without the distance formula is if it's a horizontal or a, court, uh, or a vertical line that looks like this or this. And the reason that's, uh, that is so is because um, the x you can, you can subtract points merely just between the x-axis and the y-axis. But if you have a horizontal line that goes like this, you cannot use coordinates, uh, basic coordinates and subtraction to do that. You would have to plug it into this equation. And even if you don't know that horizontal and vertical lines, you don't need to use the distance formula for, you can still plug it in and it will always work. So it's x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. All the square root of that entire value equals the distance on a coordinate plane between two points. And you can you, you can use that because you're going to draw multiple segments to form a figure. And after you uh, figure out that two points actually make a line segment, you can form entire the entire figures and discover the relationships, such as area on a coordinate plane. So the distance formula is used to calculate horizontal distance on the coordinate plane. That's because vertical and um, I, I apologize. Um, this is supposed to be not horizontal, but this is supposed to be slanted. So this is supposed to be slanted distance on the plane. I apologize for confusing you. So horizontal and vertical distance can be calculated on your own, meaning you can just subtract y values for vertical distance and horizontal distance, you can subtract x values. But for slanted distance, like on a, on a slope, uh, on a curve, not on a curve, but anything that's not a vertical or a horizontal distance, which is a slanted distance like this, um, you would actually need to use a distance formula to discover that. Um, so I'm gonna say vertical, equals um, subtract y values. So you're just gonna subtract the y values given for vertical distance, horizontal. Keep in mind, I'm talking about distance in general between two points. You're gonna subtract the x values for um, your horizontal distance. So subtract x values. Subtract x values. And then for your slanted distance, you're going to use the distance formula. The slanted equals distance formula. All right, so now that we know our equation here, and, and keep in mind, vertical and horizontal here that I've written down, that's just a shortcut to know that so that you don't have to waste your time computa computationally. But if you don't know that, you can just merely um, put it into the distance formula. Any distance will, can be calculated through your distance formula, even a calculation to see if there's a zero distance needed between coordinates. So let's look at two practice problems here. I have two different types of practice problems. One's going to be with a rectangle and one's going to be a parallelogram. I'm trying to give equal representation, but I will be coming on, going later on, you know, with example problems. And of course, our quiz on our website will have, you know, different types of figures in the same concept, but the concept's always going to be the same, very simple. So let's uh, calculate the area with the distance formula. Let's calculate the area of this rectangle here, as shown below. So this rectangle is obviously not does not have any horizontal or vertical uh, sides, so we cannot use that shortcut, that bit of a shortcut. So we're going to have to use the distance formula. So the way that we're going to calculate this is we only need the length and the width. So that means we're only going to need this side here, um, uh, one side, um, one length here. So I'm going to label this our length. And then we're going to label this our width. So we only need the length of these two sides to calculate the area. Because remember, the area of a rectangle is length times width. So once we've calculated these two lengths, we're going to multiply them together in order to get the area of this rectangle. So if we look at this uh, side length here, we have the side. Um, we have our coordinates at. So I'll call this line here length. So I'll write L here. And that equals, uh, we have our first coordinate, negative 7, negative 1. And then our second coordinate is up here, and that is negative six, negative, sorry, negative six, four. We'll calculate the distance with that by plugging it into our distance formula. So that'll equal the square root of the difference between the x values. So that'll be negative seven 
minus negative 6 squared plus negative 1 minus 4 squared. Then we can simplify that. So we'll, we'll simplify what's within parentheses. So negative 7 uh, minus negative 6 is negative 7 plus 6. And negative 7 plus 6 is negative 1. So we have negative 1 squared plus, so negative 1 minus 4 is the same as saying negative 1 plus negative 4. And negative 1 plus negative 4 is negative 5. So we'll say plus a negative 5 squared. And then we can simplify that to get um, 1 squared plus 5 squared. So 1 squared is negative 1 squared is 1. So negative 1 squared is 1, and negative 5 squared is 25. So 25 plus 21 is 26. And you can simplify that. You can put that. You can simplify that. Sorry, you can simple that. Um, you can put that into simplest radical form. And you would have to look at 20, uh, root 26 to see if it has any other square roots within it. Um, so the factors of 26 are, you know, 2 and 13. And yes, that, that, that's all of the the um, factors of 26 other than itself. So you would leave root 26 as root 26 here. And then the next one, we're going to calculate our width here. So our width is has points at, on the coordinate plane, it has points at negative 6, comma 4 as well as 4, 2. We're going to calculate the distance between them. So that's 4, 2. And uh, we'll plug that into our distance formula. So put that into our distance formula. So we're going to subtract the x value, so negative 6 minus 4 squared plus 4 minus 2 squared. All right. And then we're going to simplify that to get that negative 6 minus 4. Negative 6 minus 4 is negative 6 plus negative 4. That's negative 10 squared plus 4 minus 2, which is 2. And we're going to do 2 squared as well, so 2 squared. And then if we simplify that furthermore, we get that negative 10 squared is 100. So it's going to be uh, 100 plus uh, 2 squared, which is 4, so 104. And then it's going to be square root of 104. Now, if we look at root 104, we can see that root 104 in simplest form, in simplest radical form, will be um, equivalent to 2 times root 26 due to the fact that root 104, um, the largest perfect square that goes into root 104, is actually 4. So 4 square rooted is 2, and we're going to leave that at 26. So our simplified form is 2 root 26. So I'm going to clear my screen out, um, leave the important information that we have. It's important to do so, so that you know exactly what you need to be focused on. And then we're going to calculate our area. So as you can see here, I've just put up the important information after we calculated uh, with the distance formula of our uh, four different points. We can see that our width of this rectangle is 2 root 26, and our length is root 26. So all we're going to do now is length times width, which is the area of a rectangle. We're going to multiply 2 root 26 by root 26. And if we simplify that, we actually get, out, um, get a smooth answer of 52. So that's our answer, and that'll be 52 square units as our answer for the area of this rectangle. So 52 square units. Let's move on to our final problem. Area on the coordinate plane has still, and we're still gonna calculate the area with the distance formula. This is a bit simpler. We're gonna be calculating the area of this triangle. Um, as you can see here, this is an oblique triangle. So we're gonna have to first calculate the um, altitude of this triangle, and then we can identify what our base is. So let's first identify what we want as our base. So let's identify ML, this side ML as our base here. This side right here will make this our base. And now we're going to try and calculate the um, height of this tri triangle right here. So we know that um, we can calculate the vertical distance uh, between ML to the, to, uh, to the vertex of K. And um, the way to do that is you're going to draw a vertical line 
that basically intersects ML uh, at a perpendicular line. And that's and since ML is a perfect horizontal line, you need a perfect vertical line in order to intersect it. So the way to do that is you take point K and all you're gonna do is you're gonna draw a straight line down and you're gonna connect that to ML. So right here, this is your um, uh, altitude right here. Right here. So that'll be your altitude of this triangle here. And I'll indicate that with a 90 degree angle. So that's your altitude right here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and calculate the distance between, we're gonna try and calculate the height of this altitude. We're gonna try and calculate its value. So we know that vertical distance, you don't need to use the, um, the distance formula. All you need to do is subtract the Y values. So the uh, very starting point right here of this altitude is at um, point negative two comma one. So it's at negative two comma one. That's our first point of the altitude. Um, so I'll just write here altitude. So that's two comma one. And the top part at point K is going to be um, negative two comma five. So that's negative two comma five. And all we're gonna do here is we're gonna subtract Y coordinates. So here we're gonna subtract five minus one and that equals four. So our height um, equals, our altitude equals a four. So, uh, and also we're gonna calculate the distance between M and L to calculate the base of our um, triangle here. So we know that M is at a point, um, it's at point right here, one, two, three. So it's at point negative three comma one. And we know that point L, the second point of our base is at one comma one. And that's our base. So now all we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate the distance between those two and we're just gonna subtract the X coordinate. So we can do um, one minus negative three. And that's basically saying one plus negative, one plus three and that's equivalent to four as well. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply our base times our height. So I'll split this off here put this section over here. So it's gonna be base times your height or H here. And our base is equivalent to four. So it's going to be four times four, which is our altitude. And then we're gonna divide that by two. So four times four is 16. And then 16 divided by two is eight. So the area of this um, triangle is eight units squared because it's area we're gonna square our unit. So that's the answer for this problem. All right, guys, I hope you guys enjoy. All right, everyone, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I will, uh, this has been the eCore Academy eLearning platform today. Please make sure to like and subscribe down below and turn on post notifications to get notified on any of our channel's latest posts. Visit our website at ecoreacademy.org um, if you want all full, full unlocked access to all of our um, other perks and added items that we give with just not just our videos, but we also give integrated note sheets and worksheets as well as quizzes that go along with each and every single video. And it's all organized into course studies with other event information and other accesses there as well. We have all, our, all of our information there as well uh, and contact information there. But if you don't already, um, if you haven't already made an account, which is free at our website, um, you can also make sure to email us at equacademy at gmail.com. We will try our best to respond if you just want to reach out to us or ask us any questions in general. Um, and also visit all of our socials in the description box below. We have our links down there at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, you know, check us a follow out there. Uh, see what kind of unique content we have there as well. Once again, everyone, I hope you all enjoyed. This has been AJ Raj, and I will see you guys in the next one. Peace.